Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia Online. My name is Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and it's my pleasure to welcome our guests this evening. An author, historian, and former journalist, John Gesvinian is the Executive Director of the Middle East Center at the University of Pennsylvania. He is the author of Untapped, The Scramble for Africa's Oil, described by the Boston Globe as a riveting account and superb analysis of the competition between world powers for the emerging market of crude oil from a dozen African countries. The co-editor of American and Muslim Worlds Before 1900 and a contributor to periodicals such as Newsweek, The Nation, and The Huffington Post, he has taught Middle East history at a number of colleges and universities. In his new book, Gazvinian charts the tangled relationship between America and Iran from the Persian Empire of the 18th century to the often icy diplomacy of today. Tonight, Professor Gazvinian will be in conversation with Ambassador retired John W. Limbert, former U.S. Deputy Secretary of State for Iran from 2009 to 2010. The ambassador has a lengthy biography, even in short form, so pardon the pricey as I mentioned some of the highlights. He served for 34 years in the U.S. Foreign Service and for 12 years as class of 1955 Professor of Middle Eastern Studies at the United States Naval Academy. He has served as the ambassador to Mauritania, Chief of Mission in Sudan, and President of the American Foreign Service Association. He also served two tours in Iraq in 2003 and 2004. Before joining the Foreign Service, he taught in Iran as a Peace Corps volunteer in Kurdistan province and as an instructor at Shiraz, then Pahlavi University. He is the author of a number of books about the history of and how to negotiate with Iran. And most recently, he co-authored the novel Believers, set in Iran and Washington during the 1980s and the present. Ambassador Limbert holds the Department of State's highest award the Distinguished Service Award, and the Department's Award for Valor, which he received in 1981 after 14 months as a hostage in Iran. Gentlemen, the screen is yours. Uh, uh, thank you, Andy, and thank you for the invitation, and th thank you to the Philadelphia, uh, the Philadelphia Free Library for this uh, putting on this wonderful event. And first of all, let me thank uh, the author, our uh, author, a good friend and colleague, uh, John Gazvinian, for writing what is a spectacular book. Uh, it is just amazing. Uh, uh, it, it is just amazing. So my recommendation to all everyone tonight is, if you haven't bought it, go out and buy. Uh, uh, go out and buy it. You could even buy it maybe online while we're waiting while while you're listening to this. Uh, after all, the book starts and ends uh, with a verse of Hafez, um, and there, uh, you know, there is a country that has produced not not one but many masterpieces of world art and literature over its history, and Hafez is one. But his his wisdom just never never ends, uh, though he was writing. He was writing uh, seven or eight hundred years ago. He was writing in a time very much like our own, very un very unsettled, very violent sometimes, and very uh, um, uncertain. Well, let's start from the beginning. Let's start from the beginning. Uh, John, um, why did you write the book? What brought you to this? What brought you to the subject? Well, thank you very much. Uh, and also before answering the question, I also just want to say uh, thank you to uh, the Free Library for inviting me uh, this evening, inviting us. And uh, I'm, I also just really want to say what an incredible pleasure and honor it is to be here with uh, John Limbert. This is uh, uh, someone that, you know, I just really, really admire. Uh, and it's it's a real privilege to be able to, be able to have this conversation uh, with you. Uh, Obviously, you know, as someone who's just spent many years of his life working on the history of U.S.-Iran relations, uh, to uh, you know, to be able to to, to have a, a, a conversation with someone who is really an institution in U.S.-Iran relations and has played such a, a critical role uh, in that story is uh, is really an honor. So thank you for agreeing to do this, uh, especially agreeing to do this at the last minute. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, why did I write the book? Um, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, Basically, so I'm a historian. Um, I was trained as a historian. 
Um, I actually, I didn't particularly like history in high school. I will say that. Um, but I began to develop an appreciation for how cool history actually is uh, as an undergraduate. But I didn't actually study Iran or Iranian history or even American history initially. I did British history uh, and focused especially on the 16th and 17th centuries and uh, focused on East-West interactions uh, between Britain and the, uh, and the Ottoman Empire and the Persian Empire in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, for a lot of my life, I wasn't necessarily interested in writing about Iran. Uh, although I am of Iranian background myself. Um, but, you know, over the years, uh, as I've grown older, and especially in the years after September 11th, 2001, I think like a lot of people of Middle Eastern heritage, I began to take more and more interest in this part of the world and, uh, and my own background. And so uh, my first book was a work of journalism, um, but I decided I wanted to, get, to come back into history, come back into my training uh, for this book. Um, and I was kind of, thinking to myself, well, what is it that hasn't been done? What hasn't been written about Iran? That, what can I possibly add to this? Uh, and as a historian, I thought, well, this is, this is what I want to do. I want to tell this, the whole story of Iran and the United States. Now, that had been done before in some ways. Uh, James Bill had written a fantastic book in the late, at the end of the 1980s, uh, and there have been others. Um, but what I noticed immediately was that every book on the history of U.S.-Iran relations began somewhere around 1940. And I understand why they did that, right? Because before 19, the early 40s, before Pearl Harbor, the US is an isolationist power. It has no real interest in places like Iran. Uh, to the State Department before 1940, Iran might, might as well have been Antarctica. It was a far flung part of the world with no strategic American interest. So I understand why American historians using American archives start there, but I, quickly realized there's something wrong with that, which is because what, what message does that send? To me, the message that that sends is that the history of US-Iran relations only becomes important when the US becomes interested. What I quickly discovered was that for 90 years before 1940, from the 1850s at least, Iran was very interested in getting the US more involved in its, in, in its business. I mean, the, it, one Iranian government after another from the 1850s to the 1940s, every government tried to develop a closer relationship with the United States. And to me, that is just an, as interesting a part of the story. Uh, and when we leave that out, we're not telling the full story of the history of U.S.-Iran relations. You know, you know, it's very refreshing to have a historian deal with these subjects. I was, I was trained as a, I was, I was trained as a historian. And when anyone ever asks me anything uh, about anything, I always say, let's go back to the beginning. Uh, and of course, in the case of Iran, as you, uh, um, in the case of Iran and the US, you have gone well back to the, you have well back, uh, well back to the beginning. Uh, but you mentioned James Bill, for example, in his wonderful book, and and I, uh, another scholar is Richard Cot uh, uh, Richard Cottam, another uh, excellent sc American scholar of U.S. Iran relations. Uh, they were both political scientists, and I often thought what that history in this particular relationship plays a huge role, and I wonder if people are aware of that. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. What is the role of history in this relationship, and does it receive the uh, attention that it should? I think that's a, that's a great question, and in fact, you know, I think what troubles me and to this day about all of this is that history is very present in this conversation about the United States and Iran, but unfortunately, like everything else between the U.S. and Iran, history is used as a weapon. It's used as a club to beat your opponent with and to say, oh, you started it. No, you started it. And to me, that's a really unfortunate use. Actually, it's an abuse of history, of, of something I really care about and you care about, which is history. Uh, that's not what history is about. Uh, that's not, you know, history is not a, it's not a, it's not a courtroom. It's not like, you know, going before Judge Judy and trying to decide who's right and who's wrong. Uh, you know, the history helps us. I think history can liberate us. I think the problem with the history of US-Iran relations is that everybody wants to talk about whose fault is it? How did it go so wrong? I think those are valuable questions, but they're not the only questions we should be asking. 
when we focus on whose fault it is, it is, then we focus, I think, disproportionately on the on two events: the CIA-backed coup against Mohammad Mossadegh in 1953, uh, and the uh, Iranian hostage crisis at the U.S. Embassy, which, of course, I bet you know very well, uh, in 1979. Uh, because these are the two sort of original sins that are used uh, uh, to cast blame and, 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 and to increase antagonism. And I think the history is so much richer than that. And I also think the other part of that question, which is, um, where did it all go so wrong? I mean, that's, that's the other implicit question that people, I think, ask of us as historians of U.S.-Iran relations. Help us understand why this, you know, how this all went so wrong. I think that's, again, that's a fair question, but embedded in that question is some other questions that don't get asked, that are implicit, which is, oh, if it all went so wrong, then it must have all gone right at some point. Uh, and just as interesting to me is how did it, if that's true, then how did it all go so right? Why did it go right? What went right? And did it actually all go so right? Mm -hmm. Was there actually a sort of golden age of US-Iran relations that all got destroyed by the evil Americans or the evil Iranians? Um, Maybe there wasn't, maybe there was. I, my short answer is I think, yeah, I think you could make a case for the 1910s, 1920s, 30s and 40s as a sort of golden age of maybe of US-Iran relations. Um, but I actually think the irony is very few people know about that period. You know, I think that you often hear people who are critical, for example, of US foreign policy that say everything was fine until 1953, until the US overthrew Mossadegh. I actually don't disagree with that. That's a perfectly reasonable point of view, I think, in many ways. But what I, what's always interesting is, is those same people are very hard pressed to tell you, OK, if you say, well, fine, sure, everything was great until 1953. Well, what did that look like? What do you what when you say everything was great? What you know, can you describe for me what was you know, what the 1940s, 30s, 20s, you know, looked like in US and Iran relations? And that's not a question most people are able to answer easily. Uh, you know, and I think that's actually really interesting. Um, because it's a fascinating period of, of, of history, this, this relatively benign uh, period where there wasn't a lot of anger between the two countries. There wasn't a lot of strategic close relations either like there was under the last Shah, um, but there was as Hossein Allah, uh, a name that will be very familiar to you and to others, uh, you know, who was, prime, who was uh, former prime minister of Iran in the early 1920s, he was a uh, Iranian ambassador to the US and he went around to these small towns in America and gave these talks in places like Flint, Michigan. And he would always say things like, it's time for us to get beyond cats and carpets. Uh, you know, in other words, this was the, the predominant view of Americans, of Iraq, Persian cats and Persian carpets. This was that moment, I think, when the two countries began to tip over into a slightly more interesting, deep kind of relationship and to get beyond cats and carpets. Um, and that's a period I, I find fascinating as well. Well, let's, let's do the favorite activity of historians and go back to the beginning. Um, when you look to the beginning and you took it back to a period far beyond what I had ever thought about in this relate in, in this relationship. I used to, when I would teach my class, I would talk, uh, talk about um, the 19th century and the coming of the missionary and the, the coming of the missionaries, but you took it back much farther. What did you find? Yeah, it's interesting. It was a, perhaps an eccentric choice uh, to go back well before there was any actual live physical human contact between these peoples. But I actually thought, you know, in any relationship, there's a prehistory as well. Uh, there's the preconceived notions you have about someone before you even meet them. Uh, and those are just as interesting because, you know, those are the things we bring with us in the first, in the first when we have our first contacts, right? Um, so yes, there, you know, we could talk about the 19th century missionaries Presbyterian missionaries who went uh, from the US to Iran and so on. But I thought, you know, I want to, let's go back even a century before. And by the way, originally the book was supposed to start in 1600. Uh, I ended up cutting a lot of that stuff. This book was originally twice the length it is today. And you can thank my publisher for that, for pushing me and pushing me to cut it and cut it and cut it. Uh, but I ended up starting in 1720. And the reason I did, and I'll be very, very brief, even though I would love, I, I love talking about this stuff, um, is that it, absolutely blew my mind to, to, to my complete surprise I found when I was looking for early colonial American newspapers from before the, the time that the US even existed in the 1720s the first American newspapers published in Philadelphia and Boston uh, just out of curiosity I was looking to see if they made any mention of Persia as they would have called it then 
And not only did they make mention of Persia, but they were obsessed with Iran. They were, they were obsessed. 20 to 30% of every week's newspaper was taken up with Iran. And not only were they consumed with Iran, but they were very pro-Iranian, overtly, vocally pro-Iranian. Um, and the reasons for that, I would love to get more and more into, but basically short version, there was a, a rebellion that brought down the Safavid empire in 1722 by the Afghans in the East. And they assumed that the Afghans were being, uh, that they were colluding with the Ottoman empire, which they considered the evil empire of its day. Um, and therefore the enemy of my enemy is my friend because they knew that the Ottomans and the Persians were rivals. And they loved the fact, they had all these ideas about Iran, that Iran was somehow less evil because it was less Muslim, because the Sunnis looked down on the Shia uh, as heretics. And so therefore uh, th that makes them better in our eyes, actually, <laughs> they're, they're not as Muslim somehow. They don't, and they, would, they would even try to explain to their readers the difference between Sunni and Shia in 1720s in, 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 you know, in North America. Amer you know, people were reading about that and they didn't always do a good job, but you know, they would say things like, oh, the, the, the Shia worship Ali instead of Muhammad. You know, that's not quite how it is, but um, you know, and, and then there was biblical aspects to it. They loved, these were Puritans and they loved the idea, you know, in the Bible, they take the Bible very literally and in the Bible, uh, you know, Cyrus, the, the Iranians look very good. You know, Cyrus the Great liberates the Jews from the Babylonian captivity in Ezra chapter one. Uh, the three Magi, the three Zoroastrian priests that come from the East, they're basically Iranians. Um, Magi is plural of Magus, which means Mog, which is like a Zoroastrian priest. Um, so, you know, Iran was always to them this kind of fantasy land just to the East of everything that was threatening, just to the East of the Ottoman Empire, just to the East of the Babylonians, just to the East of Eden. And my first chapter is called East of Eden because they believed that literally the Ottomans were in possession of all of the biblical lands, including the east of Eden, including the Garden of Eden, which was the easternmost biblical uh, site, and that the Persian Persia began just to the east of that. So it was just this harmless, exotic Oriental kingdom. Now, why am I going on about this so long? Because I think that mentality stays with us right up until the 1970s. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the uh, you know the American dominant American narrative about Iran in the 1970s was this, this was this exotic Oriental kingdom led by a pro-American uh, Shah who was somehow less evil and less Muslim than the Arabs and, you know, and, and, and that it was somehow more benign. And I think that this is, you know, uh, I think this, these kinds of preconceived notions, they stay with us. Maybe, maybe there's a sentiment, John, that some Iranians would share in, uh, that what attracted, what was the attraction was that these people were not Turks. Exactly. Not Turks, not Arabs. I mean, yes, it's true. There's a certain kind of Iranian that loves to <laughs> focus on that these days in their, in their conversations with Americans, right? Mm -hmm. I, I have to say, I don't like this kind of discourse as an Iranian-American. You know, I, I cringe when I hear my fellow Iranian-Americans, you know, sort of going out of their way, this kind of forelock tugging way to sort of, you know, when they're talking to Americans, oh, you know, we're not Arabs, you know, we're not even really that Muslim, you know, we're not, you know, it's... Uh, it's unfortunate, but it's a, you know, it's a, I guess, a product of a certain kind of discourse. Right. Well, we can get in. We, I, I, I wasn't going to go uh, to go there, but we can always get into this discussion. We can always get into a discussion of uh, the use of Iranian versus the use of Persian uh, to describe people. But I think it goes. It, maybe it goes back to uh, Ambassador Allah's comment about uh, cats and car cats and carpets. Uh, you mentioned the missionaries, uh, and that was the first that was the first contact in the 19th century. I, I think it was extremely extremely important, and most historians did, most historians do. Could you talk a little bit about what those contacts were like and what happened? What happened? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so actually, it's interesting because so the Presbyterian missionaries in Iran this was, this is the first really well documented sustained contact. Between Americans and the Iranians, but I don't. It's not really the first. Actually, the very first Iranians and Americans to interact with each other probably were rum traders. They just mm. didn't leave a lot in the way of records. We know that large amounts of American rum and whiskey were, were making their way into the Persian Empire around the turn of the nineteenth century, around eighteen hundred. The American ambassador in Constantinople, the minister, complaining, you know, about the large quantities every day of rum, what he called Boston particular, which is rum laced with whiskey. It was making its way through uh, through um, the Ottoman ports into uh, into you know bound for Persia, um, you know. But we don't know much about this. 
um, and actually the very first American to set foot in Iran was a guy by the name of Joel Roberts Poinsett. This is the guy who gave his name to the poinsettia flower that you always see at Christmas time. There's a South Carolina gentleman who showed up in, in Baku in what is today Azerbaijan, but at the time was part of Iran uh, in 1805. And you know, there's a great story I like, I love to tell where he meets the local villagers uh, and they're all taking notes on everything he has to say. And they're just fascinated. He, they don't really believe such a place as America actually exists. They've heard of France, they've heard of Russia, but he says they believe for Amer America for them is like an oriental tale. Uh, and they keep asking them, they keep asking him, who is your king? Who is your king? And the US has just had a revolution. Uh, and he's trying to explain constitutional government, democracy, you know, things like that, republicanism. Um, and they're not quite getting it because this is 1804 and really no one in the world has this kind of government. It's kind of an eccentric form of government. Everyone's got a king. And so he says, eventually he gives up and he's, and he, you know, he's, the guy in the corner is writing everything he says. And he says, uh, you know, he says, eventually I gave up and somewhere in the annals of this village, uh, the name of Thomas Jefferson is inscribed as the Shah of America. Uh, which I, I always find kind of an amusing uh, anecdote. But I'm ignoring your question, which is the missionaries. So these are the first actual contacts, but it wasn't until about 30 years later in the 1830s that you started to have American missionaries making their way to Iran. And these were Presbyterians who were not actually there to convert Muslims or Jews to Christianity. They were there to convert Christians. So uh, Iran has a significant Christian minority of uh, Assyrians or Ashuri, uh, and Armenians and Chaldeans, um, but they were cons American Presbyterians considered these to be a form of deformed Christianity, and so they actually went over there to convert these Christians into a better, quote unquote, better form of Christianity, American style Presbyterian Protestant Christianity. Um, and the idea was they really believed that by building schools and clinics and improving these people's lives, that they would set such an example to the rest of Iran that all the Muslims and Jews would also convert to Christianity. It was kind of a crazy idea when you look back. But the legacy of that is that they ended up building many, many schools and clinics and teaching literacy and doing a lot of really good, useful things uh, and living. Uh, that, that mission lasted from 1835 to 1935 for 100 years. It was the first real exercise of American soft power uh, in the Middle East. And it really had an effect uh, because Unlike the British and the Russians who were there taking advantage of Iran, what Iranians saw was that Americans were there to help Iranians. No, that it, uh, the effects ran, you're, you're right. I think the effects ran deep both in school and health. I can remember my, uh, uh, my late father-in-law, who was a medical doctor, talked about going studying medicine uh, at the missionary hospital in Hamadan. And this would have been in the, maybe the second decade of the 20th century. Uh, I mean, that was the medical school. That was the medical school, and I, there may have been, I'm sure there were others, uh, of others as well. Uh, but those effects were 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 immediate. Um, moving, uh, sort of moving up, maybe toward the present. And I know, as historians, we like to stay away from the present. Uh, could you pick out two or three, maybe just two? what you would consider critical events and maybe two or three crucial people who, which affected who and which affected uh, this relationship and maybe whose effects are still felt today. Wow, that is a fantastic question. Yeah, throughout history or recent history? Or? Uh, in your in your people that you encountered. I mean, you, you can go back as far as you like. Oh, boy. Oh. If you want to include Thomas Jefferson, that would be fine. That would be fine. OK, that, that's a question I really enjoy. Yeah. Uh, the one the first one that comes to mind is, is Morgan Schuster, mm -hmm. uh, who is not as well known as I think perhaps he could be. Um, Morgan Schuster was a guy, a 35-year-old Washington lawyer, uh, who in 1911 was sent over uh, by, to Iran to serve as Treasurer General of Persia to basically uh, reorganize uh, Iran's finances. Right after Iran had had its first revolution, uh, first modern revolution, the Constitutional Revolution of 1906-1909, uh, or the Mashrute. Uh, I don't. This is a lot of history, so I don't want to, you know, get too into the deep, <laughs> into the weeds here, but. You know, Iran was an absolute monarchy, and and like a lot of countries by you know the late nineteenth, twentieth century, that was starting to you know, people were starting to rebel against that. They had had a revolution against 
absolutism and there was a, a, a new constitution and a parliament and so on. But the Russians and the British were still very, very influential in Iran. And the Russians didn't like this revolution very much. Uh, and uh, they didn't like Morgan Schuster very much because he was called in by the parliament, the newly created parliament, which immediately decided, interestingly, that they wanted to choose an American to reorganize their finances. And I've read some of the newspapers from the time. They said, oh, you know, Americans conduct business with integrity, free of red tape, you know, et cetera. Uh, so they, got, they made a request formally to the US uh, and America sent Morgan Schuster in, his, in a private capacity to serve as treasurer general. And he ended up going down as a kind of hero to, the, to that generation of Iranians. Because as soon as he arrived, he decided that he was going to interpret his role as treasurer general much more broadly than just treasury. Uh, he was going to go after corruption, but he was going to go after especially the interference of the imperial powers of the Russians and the British, especially the Russians. And so he, he just started to just stick it to the Russians in every way that he could. And, and, uh, and this new generation of Iranian nationalists really, really liked him a lot. Um, eventually, the Russians got the upper hand. Uh, they brought the former Shah back to power. They you know, firebombed the parliament and uh, Shuster was thrown out. He only lasted six months. But on his way out of Iran, people were waving American flags on the streets of Tehran as his motorcade left the city. Uh, you know, Aref Akazvini, the famous poet of the time, composed a verse about Schuster. Uh, and when he, Schuster arrived back in the US, he became a, a celebrity in the US. There was a stampede just, just down the street here on Walnut Street in Philadelphia. There was a stampede of thousands of people who were going out to hear Morgan Schuster speak. Uh, Americans had become suddenly enamored of Iran's constitutional revolution. It was the first time the people of both countries really started to like each other. Iranians started to realize that Americans had integrity and they, they, they cared about the values and the principles of Iranian national independence. And um, even though actually the US government gave no backing to Shuster. Uh, and then Americans were kind of excited by this, this new plucky young uh, nation that was kind of pulling itself up by the bootstraps. That's one character. You asked for two, maybe I should stop because I feel like I went on too long just with that one. I mean, uh, the other one is kind of easy. It would be Mohammad Mossadegh. You know, I mean, uh, you know, the the kind of nationalist Iranian prime minister who um, was one of the few people who opposed bringing Shuster back to Iran. He said he really admired Shuster. So I'm going to assume that a lot of the people in the audience already know a little bit about Mossadegh. But I'll say this: I bet many people don't know. He admired Shuster. He was of that generation. But he said, you know, a nation that cannot get its own house in order is not a nation that deserves to survive. He said, we need to be able to do this for ourselves. And that was Mossadegh's nationalism from day one. And that is, that is what he carried with him right up until 1953 when he was overthrown by the CIA. No, that's, fa that's, uh, that's fascinating. And I did not know uh, about the connection with, Moss uh, um, uh, with Mossadegh. Uh, now, let's, um, I want to go on to something, and then we'll move on to questions from the audience. I'll just do sort of one last, one last question. Um, this is one, actually, I, when I taught U.S.-Iran relations back at the Naval Academy, this was my final exam question to the student. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> and the question was this, um, why, why have relations between the U.S., and Iran been, for the last 40 years uh, have been so difficult? And why have efforts to change them all failed? Wow, I would love to read some of the essays that your students wrote about this question. They, they were actually, the essays were pretty damn good. I have no doubt. They probably have a much better idea than we do because we were too deep in the details probably. Um, I would say very briefly that uh, throughout the 1980s, the onus is on Iran. Iran is going through a very radical revolutionary phase, as you know better than anyone. Uh, and there was not much reasoning with Iran. Uh, the United States tried in Iran Contra to sell weapons to Iran and so on, but I think uh, it needed to go through that kind of thermidor kind of phase, post revolutionary phase. I would say, though, that since the early to mid 1990s, um, Iran has moderated and quite a bit. Now, it doesn't mean that it's perfect or it's exactly the way we might want it to be, but I think that Iran has been more open to the idea uh, of better relations with the US, but the US has kind of shot itself in the foot many times. And the reason I think the US has done that 
is because I think there is unfortunately an institutional inability, inability is the wrong word, an institutional unwillingness for some reason among the American foreign policy establishment to recognize that the Islamic revolution is, there's no turning back, uh, that, that the Islamic Republic is here to stay, whether you like it or not. I'm reminded of Ronald Reagan. Just the, you know, you, you actually mentioned Hafez, which is one of, one of the quotes in the epigraph of my book. The other quote is from Ronald Reagan, who says in November 1986, he comes on television during the Iran-Contra affair, and he says, the, Ronald Reagan looks into the camera and says to the American people, the, um, the Iranian revolution is a fact of history. But between American and Iranian basic national interests, there need be no permanent conflict. We've never really heard much of that since from American leaders, a little bit from Obama, but for the most part, the institutional attitude of the US political establishment since then has, has been very different. It's been very focused on the idea that Iran, that the Islamic Republic is a house of cards and it's about to collapse any minute. And I can understand why people might want that to be the case, but you have to take Iran as it is and not as you want it to be. Uh, because even if your goal is to destroy and defeat the Islamic Republic, you're not gonna do that unless you understand it. You're not gonna do that by believing that it is a force that is about to collapse. Uh, because 40 years, we've thrown everything at it. Uh, complete isolation has no real allies. The US has done everything possible to kind of undermine it and it's still there. So there's gotta be a reason for that. And the reason for that isn't just that it's so evil and, you know, and kind of monstrous that it somehow you know, uh, maintains itself in power that way. Um, it's, the answer to that is much more complex. Um, so I think that's one of our biggest misunderstandings. Uh, and I hope that the new administration decides to think a bit differently about Iran. Well, in the interest of full disclosure, John, um, after the students wrote their, wrote their answers, they would come to me and say, uh, Professor, what's the answer to the question? And I'd say, it beats the heck out of me. <laughs> I just really don't know. But they came up with some very good, uh, uh, some very good stuff because, you know, again, they came out with, at this with a, a fresh eye and with a realism. Well, I'm going to, that, that um, is the best part about teaching history is that's my favorite moment is when you, the look in your students' eyes when you tell them, I don't know the answer. That's the whole point of the exercise. Exactly. History, history is complicated. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask, uh, uh, I, I, we've got some interesting questions from the, from the, audi from the audience. And so let's, let's go right in. Here's, 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 a, here's one. It's a little bit in the weeds, but I think it's an interesting one. It says, are Iranians aware of the refusal of President Truman to cooperate in the British coup attempt? Um, and does this influence their view of the United States? It's a fantastic question. Um, when you say Iranians, of course, you have to say which Iranians. Uh, I would say that the majority of Iranians, probably not, no. Um, but uh, uh, people who have read the history carefully, uh, yes, probably. Um, so I think it's probably not a large enough number of Iranians to be able to, to affect their attitude, which I think is the, 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 the gist of the question. And for everyone who doesn't know what the questioner is talking about, uh, Truman was initially very reluctant to go along with Britain's desires to uh, remove Mossadegh from power. In the, uh, in, uh, but then you know, Truman um, uh, did not want to uh, stand for re-election in 1952. So uh, you know, after 20 year plus years of, uh, 20 years of, you know, Democratic uh, administrations, a Republican <coughs> Dwight Eisenhower won the election in 52 and came to power on a sort of anti-communist platform. And it was easy for the, uh, the British to sort of play on that a little bit, uh, particularly with the, with the, uh, the Dulles brothers, uh, John Foster Dulles and, uh, um, uh, and, his, and his brother. Um, so um, short answer, no, most people are not terribly aware of that aspect of it, the Truman side of the story. Uh, here's, a, here's a question um, related to history, again, uh, the craft of history and your other, your other profession, which is how does your background in journalism influence your writing of history? Thank you. I appreciate that question very much. Um, yeah, I did a PhD in history. You know, it's funny, I've always had a very mixed relationship with history because I, as I, say, I hated history as a high, in high school. So everyone who hated history in high school, I get it. Um, <laughs> And then as an undergrad, I decided I wanted to do history. And then I decided I want to go to grad school and do it. But as soon as I started grad school uh, in history, I realized, you know, I don't think I want to be a professional historian. I thought, you know, I love history. 
Uh, I don't, and I love, and I really, to this day, admire so much uh, the work that serious academic historians do. Um, but I didn't want that life. I didn't want to chase the tenure track. I didn't want to uh, write um, very, very specialized articles that were read by small numbers of people in journals and so on. To me, that wasn't what history, that wasn't what excited me about history. So I decided I wanted to go into journalism instead. Um, and I sort of had the opposite problem in some ways with journalism, which is that I, you know, I loved journalism. But, um, you know, you're writing for a large audience now, but the problem is sometimes the writing can be more superficial or very limited or, you know, very short um, or even to it, somebody else's agenda or whatever. So I really tried to make a career out of the in-between. I'm very passionate about the, 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 the middle ground between these two kinds of um, writings. Um, the idea that of academics speaking to general audiences, of making expertise accessible. And so every, all the writing I, I do, I try, I don't know if I succeed or not, you all can tell me, but I try to write to tell a story because I think as historians, it's important to tell a story. Um, I think that it shouldn't be that hard for us actually to bring the life and the soul and the characters into the stories that we tell. Both of my books have been published by trade, press, by commercial presses rather than academic presses. And that was a really conscious choice for me. My first book was a work of journalism. Uh, this one, you know, I'm, I was very lucky to have Knopf uh, uh, you know, by the uh, proposal very early on, um, you know, and I went to Iran three times to do archival research for this book. I think there is stuff in there that is useful and valuable to scholars and experts, but it was very important to me that I wrote it in a way that you could give to your uncle who loves to read history or your aunt who loves to, or your friend who loves to read history, so that it should still be a good story, uh, because otherwise to me, I'm, well, then what's the point of what we're doing? So that's how it's informed. Good. Um, here's another question, uh, uh, which, which comes up in different, in, in different ways, in different, uh, different settings. Um, the questioner writes, uh, it, it seems a lot of what makes any warming efforts between our countries impossible um, are the death to America chants. Um, are there movements in Iran to try to end these chants, chants which make uh, American cringe at the thought of any dealings with Iran? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think that when we, yes, as Iran, as Americans, I remember actually when we first, when my family first moved to the United States and I would see this death to America stuff on television, it would upset me because I, I, I'm in America now. I grew up in England, but we were in, a, you know, we were in the US, so I moved during high school, we moved to the US and I think like death to America, I, I get scared, you know, <laughs> why are they trying, who are these people? Why do they want to kill us? Um, so I think it's really, it's a shame. Um, the story of that particular slogan is complex and I don't want to try to explain it away because it, the, this is the problem always, as you know, as, as any historian knows, as any historian of difficult history knows, the moment you try to explain something, people think you're trying to ex you know, justify it. No, just trying to help you understand it. Um, that is something that, that was an outgrowth of the, uh, the Iranian revolution, which did not start out as, a, as an anti-American revolution. Um, and you will have maybe many things more to say about this than I do, but uh, obviously, you know, because you felt the impact more than anyone. Um, but, you know, it took that turn when uh, the U.S. admitted the Shah uh, to the United States. And of course, you know, everyone stormed the embassy and these, these chants, of, that's, when the, that's when the chanting began or a little bit, a few weeks before that, because of some other things as well. There was a U.S. Senate resolution and so on uh, that was very unpopular. Um, two, a couple of things just to, to kind of say about that. One is, and again, I'm not trying to play it down, but one is that, you know, from a, just a linguistic perspective, um, there isn't magbar, okay, death to, is the opposite of zendeba, which means life to. Uh, when you say long live the king, you say zendeba shah, right? Uh, so when you want to say down with the king, there's no Persian equivalent, but your Persian is much better than mine, so correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe there's a Persian equivalent. So in English, where we say long live, whatever, long live the king, down with the king, we don't, the, for whatever reason in English, we don't say the opposite of that, which is long live or, you know, quickly die, right? <laughs> which is, you know, death to. Okay. In Persian, the opposite of long live is much more literal. It's much more death, you know, and that's really, that's the gist of mad, right? You know, and I'm, and I'm not trying to make it seem less sinister because it is literally death to, uh, but that's more the gist of it. Um, and I've seen people translated as down with America, which doesn't make it any better, really. I mean, uh, you know, um, there have been, as to whether there have been progressive movements to, you know, I, Iran does not have the kind of open politics around this particular kind of issue. Uh, there are some red lines in Iran, you know, there are a lot of things you can debate, but one of the things you can't debate is some of the really core tenets of the Islamic Republic, and this is one of them. Uh, there have been moments, though, where 
they put the brakes on this. September 11th was one of those, right? Right off the September 11th, 2001, the Supreme Leader said, no, no down with America, death to America kind of chanting for the moment. There were candlelight vigils in Iran and all the rest of it. Um, and, uh, you know, there are times when people question, the problem with this slogan, I think most people in Iran don't really feel it in the same way they did 40 years ago. But when you are a revolutionary power, how do you switch that off, right? How do, this is one of the challenges for the Islamic Republic. How do you switch that off? How do you, just, 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 who, how do you come out and say, okay, we're not doing this chant anymore. We're not doing this slogan anymore. Because that looks like a climb down, even though you, know, you can make the case, look, things have changed. Let's just, let's stop with that. But it looks like some sort of concession. And unfortunately in this kind of zero sum game that we're in between the US and Iran, any kind of concession looks like weakness to the other side. So you got to put it in that context a little bit. Um, you know, but again, I, you know, I agree with the premise of the question, which is that it doesn't help Iran's image in the United States. Uh, hardcore believers in, in the Islamic Revolution and the Islamic Republic will tell you, we don't care. We don't care what our image is in the United States. Uh, but most Iranians will tell you that's actually a pretty unfortunate attitude. The, uh, I, I do recall a, uh, a couple of political cartoons at various times when um, someone was, had rubbed out that slogan on the wall and was writing uh, life sentence to America. <laughs> and the other one was common coal to America. <laughs> they were looking for some, but they were looking for substitutes that would be a little less jar, uh, less jarring. Um, here's a question, which um, I, you know, is is it, it is inevitable. It's a very interesting one, and will continue to be a matter of discussion. The question is, um, did the U.S. have any role in preparing and helping Khomeini return to Iran and start his revolution? Did the U.S. have any role in helping Khomeini return to Iran and start his revolution? I mean, no. I know this is unfortunately one of the conspiracy theories that floats uh, out there um, among. Uh, this is this is tough. You know, I, I I understand and appreciate where this question comes from. I really do. I think that every society on Earth, including our own recently, and people will get upset with me when I say this. I think that there's been too much focus on the Russians as a sort of explanation for everything. You know, sometimes when there are things about our own society we don't like to accept, like that a certain person wins an election, for example, um, it's natural to want to look for external factors. Somebody else did this to us. This is, this is not the country I know. And if you grew up in uh, the Shah's Iran and you did well in the Shah's Iran, and you suddenly, you know, particularly if you're a part of a certain elite that was doing very well, I understand, I really understand why it's hard cognitively to accept that millions of people hated his government and rose up against it. Um, and that it brought on, you know, the, and that, you know, uh, this religious figure came to power. It makes no sense if you're living in North Tehran and living this lovely life of dinner parties and banquets and, you know, fine wines and so, you know, and you think everything's doing great, why suddenly the whole country would turn, would get rid of this guy and bring in you know, this kind of, as you see it, this kind of backward, you know, a medieval kind of cleric to run, you know, it doesn't make sense. It has to be a foreign plot. Uh, and it's easy to look to think, you know, who benefited it. But this, I mean, there's simply no evidence of that. And it simply makes no sense. I mean, that is, no, quite the opposite. I mean, the US did everything. I think the US, from what we can tell, you know, didn't reach out to some of uh, Khomeini and some of the opposition activists early enough. Um, you know, and arguably, I think, I'm curious actually what you might think, but you know, arguably, I think possibly even the hostage crisis might have been prevented if there had been some better channels of communication to Khomeini and to his um, kind of crowd, uh, either before or during the revolution. I don't know, you might disagree with that. But. Uh, if I could just build on, uh, uh, just build on that, uh, on that question. Um, you mentioned the people, you know, sort of people, the, the, the elite of the country or the middle, the middle class and the upper middle class. Uh, but as I recall, as I, rem as I remember, um, a lot of people who had benefited very much from the system also joined the revolution and joined those calls for the Shah, uh, 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 calls for the Shah. And it's mysterious, you know, how do you, how do you explain that? I have one, there, there's one author, authority who talks about uh, a collective death wish uh, among the middle uh, uh, among the middle class. How do you uh, uh, how do you parse that as a, as a historian? Wow, it's a great question. I mean, look, uh, 
even the most com people, even some people with very comfortable lives can sometimes be very idealistic. I mean, look, some of Bernie Sanders' most passionate supporters are actually middle class, educated, comfortable. You know, and they're not all. You know, um, in fact, well, I, I, I'll I'll leave it at that. I don't want to make too many na analogies with American politics, but you know, I think that there was a you forget that there was a very active left in Iran in the 1960s and 1970s, and many of the so-called middle classes or prosperous, you know, people in Iran were dissatisfied with the Shah's regime, turned to the left, for example. Not all of them went to religious radicalism, you know, and, and the left and left-wing politics is a very natural place for idealistic, angry, um, you know, comfortable, but, but economically comfortable people. It's not unusual. Um, you know, so I think yeah, that's also uh, um, a part of it. But I think the, the key, the big key, I think the simple answer to the question is the Shah was very successful at doing one thing, which was, yes, the, the economic prosperity and uh, uh, social freedoms in many ways increased uh, during his reign compared to that of his father. Um, but what he didn't do was bring people into the, into the political process. So one thing that both his father and he had done, you know, by the end of the Pahlavi period, far, far more Amer Iranians had an education, far more were literate, far more had gone to university. This includes my own parents' generation, right? And yet those same people turned against the Shah. Why? It, you know, we've seen it, why, that in some ways that doesn't make sense, but we see this in other contexts as well. A political scientist can say more about this than I can. You know, it's not enough just to improve the economic or the social or, you know, freedoms or the cultural situation of, some, of, of a public. You also have to give people channels for political participation. And that simply didn't exist uh, under the Shah's regime. Here's a, uh, um, here's a question that, again, is I think is puzzled, puzzles a lot of people. It says, why has uh, Iran forgotten its unfriendly past with Russia, but can't seem to do the same with the United States? Excellent question. And one of the things that people forget, uh, Iran has a very complicated history with Russia and with Britain and with the United States. These are the three countries that I would say that is probably the most complicated relationship with. Um, Iran's history with Russia has not always been unfriendly. It was very much in the 19th century. In the 19th century, Russia was very much a threat and a, a, a kind of a bogeyman. Right after the Bolshevik Revolution, we forget, but actually the Soviet Union signed a treaty with Iran in 1921, promising non-interference in Iran's affairs, promising that it would not interfere in any way in Iran's affairs unless there was a direct immediate threat to Russia itself. And I actually don't know exactly when or if that treaty ever really even expired. Um, now, Russia or the Soviet Union, you know, by the mid 20th century was certainly interfering in Iran's affairs again. But there was a period in the 1920s when they really did leave Iran alone. Uh, and when Britain became the bad guy again. Uh, you know, so it's it's gone in kind of ebbs and flows. Uh, also, large numbers of Iranians belong to the Tudeh, the Institutional uh, uh, Communist Party of Iran that was very pro-Soviet for a long time throughout the mid 20th century. Um, at the time of the Iranian revolution, actually, you wouldn't have asked me that question, whoever asked that question, you wouldn't have asked that because around that time, I think you'll agree, John, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Iranians, the Iranian revolutionaries were just as anti-Soviet as they were anti-American initially. Um, in fact, there is this story about when they were when the students were meeting the first group of five students meeting to consider taking the embassy hostage one of them you know supposedly Ahmadinejad uh, said no you know I don't want to take part of this our, our real enemy is the Soviet Union you know uh, the, our real enemy is the left but that changed after things like Carter's admission of the Shah to Iran and then of course everything that happened since in the 1980s the Soviet Union began to decline as a power and it wasn't much of a threat to Iran anymore um, and then uh, since the Cold War, uh, of course, Russia, especially under Putin, has increase, increasingly seen its foreign policy in opposition to the United States and vice versa. It's been a very self-fulfilling kind of prophecy. And so in some ways, there's a natural alliance there, although importantly, it is not a true, true alliance or friendship. It is very much a transactional pact of convenience, I would say, uh, you know, looking at kind of Russian-Iranian relations today. Uh, here's a here's a question more getting more down to the to the human level. Um, it's an interesting one. He, this uh, this gentleman writes. Um, I was in grad school in 1979 uh, and had Iranian friends uh, who were devastated and lost in exile. 
Uh, how do such people feel today and have many uh, returned? I mean, it addresses a general question about the, uh, the, diaspora, the Iranian diaspora. And grad school in 79 with several friends who were Iranian. Oh, okay, in the U.S. and were devastated. Yes, yeah, I assume he was in grad school in the U.S. He had Iranian friends uh -huh. who then ended up uh, as uh, as exiles. I see, I see, I see. Um, so many did repatriate, yes. Many did go back, uh, Some uh, for many different reasons. Some because they were true believers in the revolution and wanted to go back and be part of it. Some waited until things felt like they were a bit more comfortable and went back in the 80s or in the 90s or whenever. Uh, and many did not. Uh, many stayed and have stayed here ever since. Um, and I think the answer to how they feel about it is, is really, really mixed. Uh, I mean, I think that it is, I do think there is, it's possible to talk about a slightly different kind of nostalgia among Iranians who left before the revolution versus those who left as exiles after the revolution. Uh, the latter tend to be much more anti-Islamic Republic for obvious reasons, they fled. The former have more mixed feelings about it. Often, you know, feel that much less connected to Iran because they've been out of Iran for a very, very long time. You know, and I have people in my family that fit both these descriptions. And, you know, there isn't a simple answer to that. I think it's a, it's a really individual by individual kind of, um, kind of feeling. So uh, by the way, I want to say hello to James Good, who I see is on the call. It's lovely to see you, Jim. Jim Good is one of the people who work has inspired mine. Uh, and I'm just so honored to have to see him here as well. So thank you for coming. Well, read, his, read his books if you really want to understand this history. James has a, uh, he was a Peace Corps uh, also, I'm, I'm proud to say one of, one of the products of Iran Peace, uh, um, Iran Peace Corps. Um, he has a question, I, I was about to put it to you in fact. Um, he says, John, I, I love to see the passion, your passion for the subject here tonight. Um, can you talk a little about your future work? Uh, how have you chosen this uh, new subject? this question uh, so thank you Jim again for coming um I so hmm, I, I'm always reluctant to talk too much about future work uh but I I have a few ideas and they mostly have to do with the early history because as you can probably tell I really get excited when I talk about the early history more than the more recent history even though I think the more recent history is super interesting I think it's the early stuff people think is going to be boring and then when they really learn about it they're like wow it's you know these newspapers in 1720 were writing about Iran they were so, you know um Benjamin Franklin was like talking about how the US should emulate the Persian Empire. You know, I mean, this is really cool stuff. You know, um, I think I'd like to write a book. You know, this book, as I said early on, was originally twice as long. Um, it was 1,300 pages in, my, in the first draft. And <laughs> I take my hat off to my editor, Vicki Wilson, for pushing and pushing and pushing me to cut it and cut it and cut it down to under 600 pages. But guess what? A lot of stuff got cut, especially from the early stuff. So I'd like to write. A book that's along those lines, I think, and um, uh, and actually, I was at Stanford giving my first talk uh, a couple of weeks ago, and Abbas Milani, who had invited me kindly, and I know he, we had some disagreements in, in the New York Times book review uh, that he wrote of the book, but but he really got me pushed pushed me on this. He's like, please publish that stuff, and I would like to. So I think I would like to um, uh, do a book on Iran and America before 1953, uh, the sort of the world that was lost. Um, because uh, I think that alone is, a, is actually a pretty deep, big, rich book. Uh, so that's something that I'm kind of think, I'm kind of cooking up now. I think. Um, a quick question, just to follow up. Um, uh, a number of Iranians talk about the so-called Truman Ultimatum to Stalin uh, in 1946, 47, uh, 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 and claim that that was the re that was the, the reason that. Uh, Stalin was willing to withdraw from Azer from Iranian Azerbaijan that they, he had, that they had occupied that the Russians had, uh, had occupied. Uh, I mean, I, as an American, I was always willing to claim credit for that, uh, but I've never seen evidence that such a thing existed. Is there such is there such a thing? No, no. This is one of these things that has came sort of a not a false memory, but a sort of exaggerated memory. I think uh, among a lot of the American political establishment. Um, there was never such an, there was never an ultimatum, at least there's no evidence of one. Um, the ultimatum consisted of a little bit of rhetorical support from the US ambassador in Iran at the time, um, you know, and some quiet discomfort expressed. But the truth is like the UN was a brand new uh, agency, the organization at the time, the, um, it had just been created. So, okay, the context of this, 
US, Soviet Union, and Britain occupied Iran from 1943 to 1945 during the Second World War. The US actually instigated a, a treaty, a tripartite treaty, uh, that the, the three countries agreed that they would uh, evacuate the troops from Iran within six months of the end of the war. The Soviets didn't. They stayed in the north and they created this puppet republic, this uh, People's Republic of Azerbaijan and People's Republic of Kurdistan and so on. Uh, and it was a bit of, it was the, really in some ways the first real crisis of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. But uh, when Bush came to Shah, the Truman administration decided they did not want to go before the UN and have this big damaging battle with the Soviet Union uh, over this. Uh, it wasn't because, you know, the, the UN was a very fragile institution at the time. Um, and they, you know, they hadn't even, they, they didn't even have their building yet. They were still in Flushing Meadows, you know. So um, they didn't want to risk blowing the whole thing up over Iran. So in the end, they didn't say that much, actually. Um, you know, they expressed some vague support uh, for the idea of Iranian sovereignty, rhetorical support, but they ultimately just told the Iranians, well, maybe you should take your case before the UN. And you know, that's it. Um, that gradually over the years in the, in the mythology of the Cold War got built up, I think, in Washington into, you know, the, we stuck it to the Soviets and we, you know, they backed down, they pulled out their troops. They didn't. I mean, most historians now give most of that credit to Qabar Marsal Tani, uh, who kind of outwitted and outsmarted the prime minister at the time, who uh, outwitted and outsmarted the, uh, the Soviets. Interesting. One of one of you mentioned uh, Hossein Allah. He also had a role in that. He was, I think, he was ambassador to the UN at that time. Uh, yes, I believe that's at that time, as I recall. Uh, as I recall. Okay. Uh, one. Are we? Uh, I think we're we're down to uh, either the last question or the next to the last question. Uh, but let me let me uh, go one with which I think was inevitable in any discussion of Iran, and that is. Uh, what are your hopes for the future of the relationship between Iran and the U.S.? And what's the single most important lesson about our relationship that, that we should carry forward from the past? Yeah, I appreciate that question. Um, here's how I would answer that question. I would, rem I would say, let's go back to the very first disagreement that the U.S. and Iran ever had. Didn't actually talk about that yet tonight. The very first disagreement the US and Iran ever had took place in the 1850s. And you'll see why I'm answering the question this way in a moment. And it was about the, it was when they tried to sign their first treaty of friendship. And it took them five, six years to negotiate it. Longer than it took to negotiate the nuclear deal, the JCPOA. This was, uh, you know, I mean, it's incredible. Five years they spent trying to hammer out this treaty of friendship. Why? What was the sticking points? There were actually many sticking points, but one of the most interesting ones to me, the Iranians, because they were facing so much pressure from Russia and Britain, they wanted an American alliance that they could wave in the faces of the Russians and the British. They actually demanded American warships in the Persian Gulf, they, they demanded the stars and stripes to fly from Persian, from Iranian shipping in the Persian Gulf as a security umbrella to send a message to the British. And the Americans, of course, said, you know, we're not getting involved in entangling alliances. No way. No, obviously, we don't want to. No, no, we can't do that. This was the first. I mean, it's incredible to look back 170 years later. This is where it began. This was the first dispute. This was the first argument. Iran wanted the US more involved in its affairs. The, the Iran wanted the US to be a protector against the British and the Russians. And the US said, no, we don't wanna get involved in your business. Anyone who follows US-Iran relations today finds, is, you have to find that mind boggling, right? What I would say today for the future, like, look, we're not living in 1850, times have changed. But what would happen if the two countries channeled a little bit of the spirit of that disagreement? Instead of, I mean, I, I write about this long, warm history the two countries have. Okay, that's great. But let's just go back to the first argument they ever had. And let's channel some of that spirit. What if, the, look, Iran today is facing in some ways a very similar situation, this time not Russia and Britain, but Israel and the, and the Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, right? They're kind of, you know, putting pressure on Iran. They have this kind of un unexpected pact of alliance, convenience to isolate Iran. The one thing no one expects Iran to do today would be to, to pull a rabbit out of its hat and to, and to suddenly have a, to suddenly develop a, a better relationship with the US and wave that in the faces of the Israelis and the Saudis. You know, I don't expect that to happen, but just, but that was what they were trying to do in the 1850s. And conversely, what if the US did 
took the position it took in the 1850s and surprised everybody by saying, we don't want to, we don't care what Iran's business is its business. We don't want regime change. We respect the Islam. We do what Ronald Reagan said. The, Islam, the Iranian revolution is a fact of history, whatever, you know, hands off. The, the strongest weapon that the Islamic Republic has rhetorically these days against the US is they're always accusing the US of being an imperialistic, ar arrogant kind of power. Well, you know, imagine if the US pulled this rabbit out of its hat and took away that weapon uh, by, by, no, by saying, we're not gonna behave that way. We're not gonna give you this kind of rhetorical ammunition. Now, I'm not naive. I don't believe either of these things is gonna happen. I don't believe Iran is gonna suddenly want the US to be its protector uh, in the region. Uh, you know, or that the U.S. is going to suddenly say, you know, we, you know, completely respect the government of Iran, and you know, we, you know, they're one of our great allies. You know, that's not going to happen. But what would happen if the, if we just channeled a little bit of that spirit? As a historian, I don't like when people ask me to give policy recommendations to the Biden administration because I'm not a policy guy. There are much smarter people than me who can give advice about how to coordinate things. But as a historian, I can speak to the spirit of this relationship and say, you know, let's remember where this started. Let's remember the first argument we ever had um, because anything is possible in the arc of history. Well, I, I don't know if there are any smarter people than you uh, out there doing this, John, but uh, you know, the time has gone by very fast. We've, we've, we've really, we've come to the end of the time. I, uh, there were some wonderful questions and there's some wonderful questions that I must apologize that we didn't, that we didn't get to. I just want to say, by the way, John, I don't mean to interrupt you. If anybody feels that they didn't get their question answered or we ran out of time, I'm also on Twitter and Instagram, and uh, I'm happy to take questions there. And I also have a website you can contact me uh, through, and I'm going to drop the, I don't can I? Oh, some can, maybe, Andy, you can drop the link to the website um, in the chat as well for people, uh, or my Instagram or my Twitter handles. I'm happy to hear from people there. Oh, but let me end, let me end, uh with thanks to the, uh, the Free Library, uh, with thanks to Andy for setting this up, uh, and of course with thanks to John for writing this uh, superb book. Um, I think there was a note on the chat about where you could, where you could get it, but uh, go out and buy it, uh, don't delay. It's gonna be a very hot item. Maybe, maybe it'll disappear off the shelves very, uh, uh, very soon. But John, congratulations on a, a, a really, excellent piece of, schol uh, of scholarship and also very re very readable. Uh, and to combine the two is a rare and very valuable thing. So thank with thanks to everyone, thanks to the audience and thanks to John, uh, I will, we will now end the session.